Lord, we thank you. This is the day the Lord has made. What a beautiful thing it is to be together, gathered around your name, gathered as a community, as a huge celebration, as a testimony to this nation that Jesus is alive, that the church is strong. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Pray the word today will inspire and build and bless people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You guys can all be seated. How does the big dove here look from way up the top? Of course, when I'm up here, it turns into an eagle. Carl Lentz is the person who gave me that name, the eagle, the eagle. He calls Bobby Mother Dove. Hey, who are you? Someone up there tells my wife they love her. <laughs> Kings and queens. That's what I've been speaking about in most recent times. Kings and queens. Well, literally, influence and influences. In Proverbs 11, verse 11, the scripture says the good influence of godly citizens causes a city to prosper. But it says the moral decay of the wicked drives it downhill. The good influence of godly people can literally prosper their cities and their towns and their communities and their villages and their neighborhoods. The good influence of godly citizens can cause a city to prosper. I love that thought that we, the church, can have the kind of impact on our communities, on our towns, our cities, that literally brings blessing to the city. I wonder if you believe that, and I wonder if you have a commitment to living your life in an influential way. That's how I believe every believer should think about serving Jesus. None of us were ever just called and saved for ourselves. We were saved and called for kingdom purpose. And so the good influence of godly people will cause a city to prosper. And we all know there's plenty of wickedness and evil that is causing and driving cities downhill. I wonder if the good influence of godly believers will cause a church to prosper. Well, the good influence of godly parents will cause a family, their children to prosper. Or whether the good influence of a godly business person can cause their business to flourish and to prosper. I love the thought. And you know, I look back in the Scriptures, I look at the New Testament, and I see the commitment that the early apostles had to not only living saved, but to living lives of influence, and the impact of their lives was to reach influences. So listen to some of these verses as I set it up in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. The apostle Paul, who then was Saul, he was a bad, bad man. He hated Christians. He hated the church. He was actually on his way to Damascus on a street called Straight, which is still in Damascus to this very day. And of course, he was going to speak against and witness against believers, even was in agreement with them being put to death. When God touches him, Jesus impacts him, and he has this radical salvation experience. And so there's a man called Ananias, and the Lord gives Ananias a vision that he's to go and to find Saul, who by now was blinded in this encounter he had, and to show him the way and to show him how he could now begin to see. And so this is what happens. Ananias didn't want to go because he knew of Saul's reputation. That Saul, of course, became the mighty apostle Paul. So the scripture says, Acts 9, 15, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Think about that for a moment. He was called to reach people groups, the Jews, the children of Israel, the Gentiles, everyone who was not a Jew. But what about kings? 
I think all of us, we want to reach, if you like, God's people, the church, and we want to reach the Gentiles, the world. But I wonder what kind of commitment we have to reaching the kings and the queens and all the various spheres of life, the people who are literally in a position and in a place where their influence is more significant than we could ever imagine. I want to pastor the kind of church that's committed to that. In Philippians 4 verse 22, this is amazing because Paul greeting the Philippians says, all the saints greet you, but especially those of Caesar's household. In other words, he's talking about Christians, believers in the Roman Caesar, the Roman king's own household. Influence that went all the way into the household in Rome of Caesar. That's the impact the gospel was having then. And of course, you think about Pilate putting Jesus to death. He was just the governor, if you like, Caesar's puppet. And yet the gospel was going all the way to the palace in Rome, the center of then, the then known world. I would say to every pastor here, let's believe that we can build the kind of churches that can reach people in every single area of life, people in every walk of life. One more verse, Acts 17, verse 11 and 12. I'll start halfway through verse 11. It says, the Jews received Paul's message with enthusiasm and met with him daily examining the scriptures to see if they supported what he said. In other words, uh, checking his doctrine. And in verse 12, a lot of them became believers, including many Greeks, who were what? Prominent in the community. Greeks, Christine Kane, who were prominent in the community. Women and men. Note that, not just men of influence, women and men of influence. Wow, what a challenge that is and what a possibility that is. Over 30 years ago, Next month, it'll be 34 years since Bobby and I began Hillsong Church. So well over 30 years ago, we got some of our key leaders, most of them were volunteers, a little group of people, and we went to the Blue Mountains, about an hour, hour and a half's drive from here. And we stayed in one of those little old hotels up there in the Blue Mountain, had a retreat. And one of the things we did was think about a mission statement for our church. And we took our time over it. I think it would have taken at least half a day just coming up with one sentence that could encapsulate the mission of our church. And it's actually harder to do than it sounds to bring everything that you're about down to one sentence. But this is what we came up with to reach and influence the world by building a large Christ-centered Bible-based church, changing mindsets and empowering people to lead and impact in every sphere of life, to reach and influence the world, paraphrased, by empowering leaders and impactors in every single sphere of life. The key was being Christ-centered and Bible-based, and I believe we're still that. But this was grandiose. We were a tiny church. No one really had even heard of us much then. And we're talking about reaching and influencing the world. We were a tiny, we were a small church. And we we're talking about being large. And so it was a big, big plan. Interestingly, that is still our mission statement to this very day. We have a vision statement in the foyers of most of our buildings called the church that I now see. But we've always been about equipping and empowering people to be influencers, to lead and impact, believing to raise kings and queens and all the walks and all the spheres of society. And we're still committed to that to this day. So to reach, our reach was small and influence. We didn't have any influence. <laughs> reach and influence the world. Our world was tiny. We kind of had short arms. Speaking of short arms, I want to talk to you about a guy called Jay, Jay Luston. Now, Jay came to Hillsong College a few years ago. He's Welsh. He came from the UK. You know, we've got a lot of students. Across this year, there'll be something like 2,000 full-time students in college studying. But Jay was one of those people who just stood out. 
There was just something different about him. He's kind of a giant, really, amongst the students. I remember one time getting him up onto the platform to pray, and oh, he, he lit the place up. He was explosive, the way he prayed. And so, Jay, he was just a giant. But to be honest, he was only three foot seven. I might even have a photo of Jay here somewhere. There's Jay. This is the giant I'm talking about. Well, you know, Jay, there was just an article about him in one of the biggest daily newspapers in the UK, the Daily Mail. And it was a reasonable sized article explaining that Jay has just become the smallest or shortest politician in Britain. He's just been elected to serve in politics. The, <laughs> the shortest politician. He's only 29 years of age. I was 29 years of age when Bobby and I started our church. He's only 29. He's an actor. He's a comedian. He's a preacher. And now he's a politician. But he's only got short arms. Some of you, you think when I start talking about influencers that your arms are too short. I mean, I'm six foot two, my arms aren't short, but I've felt many times when it came to making a difference, like I've got short arms. You might be thinking, well, I just go to work every day. I'm no big deal. I'm no influencer. I'm not a king. I'm not a queen. I've just got kids to look after. I'm just trying to make a living for the family. I'm just a faithful believer. I go to church and I serve and I pay my tithe and I, I'm just a good person. I'm not going to be an influencer. Well, you're exactly who I'm talking to. Jay's got short arms, but it's never stopped him from having a very long reach. And sometimes we think we have short arms, but your short arms are no excuse for you living with a very long reach. We've got one more photo with Jay, by the way, to give you some perspective. That's his wedding day. How cool is that? And so you might think, well, I, I, you know, I'm no big deal. I'm not, I'm not an influencer. I, I'm not even interested in that. But what if that's what God's called you to in life? You think about your short arms. Perfect. I just go to work every day. You're perfect. Oh, we're just good family people. We love the Lord. Perfect. Well, I'm just young. I'm so aware of all the things. Like, perfect. Perfect. You can say all that, but perfect. I grew up in a country of 3 million people, 70 million sheep. I grew up in a state-owned house. True story. I grew up in a state-owned house. 1197, tighter drive, tighter lower hut, New Zealand. My phone number was 67139. Back in those days, there was only five numbers. That's how small my world was. I felt like God wanted me to do something significant in life, but I was very aware of my short arms. You know, what's sad is when someone's got long arms. In other words, God's given them tremendous reach by giving them influence in one of these spheres of life, but they live like they've got short arms. To me, that's a tragedy. It's just influence in every sphere of life. So what are the spheres of life? They talk about the pillars of society or the spheres of society, and they include things like government. What a great place for Christians to be. Education. They talk about the arts or sport and entertainment. I love seeing believers, people passionate for Jesus on the sports field or somehow in the world of entertainment. You've got business, commerce, of course, and there's business people here. You got the church, religion. But for us, the church, to build influences there. Then you got the media. How much do we need people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and build on that foundation when it comes to the media? And I'm not just believing to have people who maybe get to write a little column in the local newspaper. I'm believing for kings and queens and the media, people who can influence the direction of the media, who can build the right foundation built on the kind of Judeo-Christian ethic that the world still so desperately needs. And then you got family. I don't know what your sphere of life, but all of us were called to something. We're all gifted and talented for something. And I believe God's not schizophrenic. 
He doesn't make you one way to use you a different way. And so all of us have got things in our life and calling and gift and talent where we can raise up in our sphere of life to a position of influence. And to whom much is given, the Word says, much is required. And so I would challenge everybody here to take a hold of the possibility and the opportunity you have to live your life with influence. So to reach and influence the world we were hoping for. And I think about reach. And I think about the call to the church to reach the marginal downwards, the influential upwards, the geographical outwards. And if we live like that, then as churches, we're living as balanced Christians. And you say, why a large church? Well, because I always believe that's what God called us to. And Mother Teresa once said, it's not about numbers. And I think she's right. She said, just help people any way you can and start with the person closest to you. And you know, that's exactly how you build a large church. Just help people any way you can and start with the people closest to us. And so if we take that responsibility and we determine we're going to live life like that, we're going to reach the marginal downwards, we're going to reach the influential upwards, we're going to reach the geographical, go into the world and preach the gospel into your world, into your sphere, into that part of society that you're called to with the good news of Jesus. Let's be long arm, short arm, but maybe long reach Christians, aware of our humanity, but committed to the God-given possibility that's on every single one of your life. God can do more in and through your life than you ever give Him credit for. God can take somebody so ordinary and do something so extraordinary. He takes normal folk just like you and me, and He can do something that absolutely confounds the people who knew you before. It's like, that can't be the same. God, that can't be, that can't be Him. It's dangerous down there because I spit a lot when I preach. I spit a lot when I preach. And so you've got to be careful sitting down there. Hey, so we want to reach people of influence in all those different spheres. But I don't just want to reach influences. I believe as a church, we're called to raise influences. In other words, for people of influence to come from our own body. People that are so committed to the work of the Lord in their lives that they refuse to just live small and to allow the devil to keep them small, keep them bound up by what they cannot do and what they can't afford and just this and just that. I'll tell you what you just are. You're just a child of God. And as just a child of God, you just happen to be very powerful. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit in you. That's who you just happen to be. You're somebody who can lift up and see God do that exceeding abundant and above anything you could ever ask or think. And this room is filled with stories and testimonies of exactly that, exactly that. So I'm believing to raise people of influence. There's a man here who's been one of my closest, dearest friends for more than 30 years. His name's Nabi Saleh. I'm sure he's up there somewhere. Well, Nabi, he was a Shiite Muslim. And he got radically saved. And today he's a a tremendous, tremendous believer and example in our church. Being one of the most loyal and committed and releasing people to Bobby and I over all of those 30 years. Well, the thing about Nabi is even when he came into our church, I don't know exactly how well off, but he was well off, but he had a big spirit. He was never afraid to stand up as a board member and tell us what he thought and help save us from ourselves, but always with the spirit of enlarging and wanting Bobby and I to be everything that God called us to be. He always tried to spur us on. And I remember looking at Nabi, generous, a giver, and uh, just his whole releasing spirit. And I'd pray, God, give me more like Nabi. And I'll just be honest with you, I think I was thinking, You know, Lord, bring more millionaires through the door. But not just millionaires, but people who got that big spirit. People who are huge on the inside, who just see possibility and want to see you fulfill that possibility. And so I'm believing, Lord, bring them in the door. 
And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, you've got to raise them up. That was over 30 years ago. You've got to raise them up. And so you wonder sometimes how Hillsong Church has so many leaders and ministry, so many leaders and church life, so many leaders and all of those various spheres I talked about in worlds like entertainment and in sport and in politics. Another lady here grew up in our church, been part of our church from the start, who has just finished a a season of 12 years as a federal politician in the parliament. All of these people from the body of our church. And it inspires me because I believe it's what we're called to do, to reach and influence this world by raising and empowering people to lead and impact in every sphere of life. If every person in this arena, in this stadium, even the ones I can't see behind there, but you can see my bald spot back there. Hey, even you back there, this room, if we all understood that we're called to be kings and queens, there's just no telling what God could do. Listen, all the way back to the covenant, to Abraham, God has raised up kings. When it comes to Abraham, Genesis 17 verse 6 says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of you. And what kings shall come from you? King shall come from you to his wife, Sarah. In verse 16, we all know she was barren, but in verse 16, same promise, I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Kings shall be from her. But to their grandson, Jacob, the promise is even more powerful, more specific. Listen to Genesis 35 verse 11. God said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. Pastors, leaders, let me prophesy it to you. Kings shall come from your church body. Kings, queens, princes, princesses, influencers, people who are doing something significant, they shall come from your church body. Parents, let's believe that it's not just babies that come from our body, literally from our body, but that we're raising princes. We're raising princesses. We're raising kings. We're raising queens. We're raising people to reign in life, which of course is the promise of the Word of God. And in whatever calling in life it is, that God has called them to. I wonder what you're called to. I wonder what area you serve. Maybe you look at somebody up here, maybe the worship team, and you know you can't do that, and you look at someone's preach like Jensen Franklin did last night, and you feel like you could never do that. Or you can look at the people who make all this production happen, and man, I like my jacket. <laughs> oh, cool. I look like a televangelist today. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm feeling like a king. Are you thinking about, okay, well, I can't do any of that. But man, what you do, none of us up here can probably do. And don't just do it with a small mentality. Why don't you decide that when it came to your parents, they didn't just give birth to a baby called you. They gave birth to a king. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons. I think it's Psalm 145. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons. And what? They shall be princes. They shall be princes in the land. That's what I believe for for my children. That's what I believe for for my grandchildren. That's what I believe for from those who literally have come physically from Bobby's and my body. Probably more hers than mine. But listen to it. But I have my part. I have my part to play. <laughs> Parents, what are you expecting? When it comes to the fruit of your body, let's believe that kings, that queens, shall come from our bodies. Amen. Kings and queens. I'm trying to find my family up there somewhere. See, there, I'm looking the wrong direction. See if my grandson happens to be in church anywhere there. You, you, 
I'll find another baby. I'm not going to prophesy over him now. I'll do that at home. I'm just going to buy. Who's got a baby around here? Anyone got a baby? Anyone? Anyone? Any baby anywhere? Anyone got? I saw a baby up there. I hope that one's still there. Otherwise, if, yeah, here we go. That's what I need. That's what I need. I need this little girl right over here. Look at her. Look at her. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. Hello. Hello. Can I have a smile from you? Do you think so? What's her name? This is Alyssa. Alyssa. Do you love her? I do. <laughs> She's beautiful, isn't she? Thank God for her mother. <laughs> Can I just hold you for one moment? Just for one moment? Can I hold you for one moment? Just come here for one little second. Will you let me? Will you let me? There she is. Look at you. You're beautiful. You know, there's a lot we can see about this little girl. We can see that she's beautiful. She's well-dressed and pink. And her name's Alyssa. And uh, there's a whole lot we can't see. You just don't know what's in this child. You just don't know. You just don't know what gifts and talents God's given her. You just don't know what God can do to raise her up to be a queen, to be a princess, to rule in life. I think it's time to rule in life. <laughs> and whatever it is, God's called them to. There's a little girl born in Tasmania. Well, the whole state's here. Everybody from Tasmania is here. <laughs> and at first when Pastor Jensen last night was talking about the giant with six fingers and six toes, <laughs> a little girl born in Tasmania sometime over 30 years ago, I can imagine her parents looking at her and thinking, oh, beautiful little girl. Wonder what dreams they have for her. Wonder what they're hoping for. A little girl in Tasmania. Maybe she'd move all the way to Hobart. <laughs> Do you think for one moment they thought, one day, our little Australian Tasmanian girl is going to be the queen of Denmark? Do you think they thought that for one second? <laughs> going to be the queen of Denmark. And so, of course, that little girl, she woke, she, she grew up, her name was Mary, and Mary was here in Sydney for the Sydney Olympics, and we are in the basketball arena for the Sydney Olympics, where I got to watch the dream team with my two sons play Lithuania. And so she was here for the Olympics, like thousands of other young people, and she was in a pub in downtown Sydney, and <laughs> she met a handsome guy as you do. So her and her friends were hanging out with some other young guys and they got chatting, got talking. What she didn't know is he wasn't just another Danish guy. He's the crown prince of Denmark. Lived in the palace in Copenhagen. Not just another guy, well the rest is history. Today little Tasmanian Mary is Princess Mary. Married to the crown prince, living in the palace and one day called to be queen of Denmark. You just don't know. You just don't know. When it comes to the people in our church, we just don't know. I mentioned the lady who went into politics and for 12 years was a member of parliament. And every time she won an election, in various ways, it was a miracle. It was against the odds. And when she first came to talk to me, she was just a lovely young lady who worked in our Hillsong City Care, and she was just faithful and did social work. And so she came to me and told me that she wanted to stand for politics and stand for parliament, federal parliament. But it was in a seat where her party had never, ever won in the whole history of that electorate's more than 50 years. No one had ever won. So she's telling me this, just sweet Louise. And I'll be honest with you. I was thinking, you haven't got a hope. <laughs> I was saying all the right things. I was encouraging her, but on the inside, I'm thinking, fat chance. <laughs> well, I'm glad that God knew more than I know. 
And I'm glad with you that God knows more than I know. I'm glad that God takes short arms like little Jay's 29-year-old short arms, three foot seven, need to step ladder to kiss his wife on his wedding day. But what a giant he's becoming. And I want to encourage you to understand that you can be a king, you can be queen, not literally perhaps a monarch over a nation, but you can be a queen or a king or a prince or a princess in whatever walk in life. Why should business people, Christian business people, spend their entire life just chasing their tail, chasing their tail, trying to get enough just to pay the bills on time? Why should you live like that? Why don't you believe to rise up and rule in business, really become somebody who is an influencer in the business world, who can actually make a huge difference? I can't see any reason why not. Just a few weeks ago, we had what we call Kingdom Builders Retreat. It was in the Hunter Valley. It was beautiful. There was, I don't know, 600 key givers in our church up there with us. And they've been an incredible group for a lot of years. And one couple wanted to spend 10 minutes talking to Bobby and I, so we had the chat. And I, I recognized them, but I don't know them well at all. And so they began to tell us how, I think it was 15, 16 years ago, they started a business. It was just a small business, like everybody starts, just a tiny little business. But when they started the business, they believed that one day they're going to be able to really do something to bless the church. And I'll be honest, as a pastor, I love the fact they said to bless the church, not just the kingdom. We're all about the kingdom of God. Every church here is about the kingdom of God. But as pastors, we need people to understand that they're, they're committed and called to a local church and they want to be the answer when it comes to their church. So I love the fact that he used the word church. Too many people, it's like, oh, we just want to bless the kingdom and it's sort of broad. But man, if, if it's not the people in the church, it's going to be a blessing to the church and provide resource for the church. No one else is going to do it. The government might back some of our social programs, but it's only people committed to their church who can really make a difference in a church. Well, that's what they told us. So that was 16 years ago. Just very recently, they sold that business. I'm not sure how much they sold it for, but I do know that from it, their sale. They made a very, very significant gift in our most recent offering to the church. In fact, a huge gift. And so he's telling me this. And then he told me that he sold the business, but in actual fact, now he not only is still the CEO or managing director of that business, but the people who bought the business have multi companies and businesses. So he's now CEO over all their businesses. One of the businesses he's CEO over is called Griffin's Biscuits in New Zealand. Every New Zealander knows of Griffin's Ginger Nuts. Ask for Griffin's Ginger Nuts by name. Now, you guys here who have Arnott's Ginger Nuts and you think that's the same thing, there is nothing like Griffin's Ginger Nuts. Oh, you dip them in your hot tea. Oh, they're beautiful in your hot tea. They just melt in your mouth. And then you got mallow puffs and you got English shrewsberries and all these amazing. When I was in Bible college 45 years ago, I worked night shift, 10 at night till four in the morning. That was one of the jobs I had at Griffin's Biscuit Factory as a cleaner, as a sweeper. I used to sweep the floors at Griffin's Biscuit Factory in Lower Hutt in New Zealand. And now he is the guy who is the boss. He sent us a, an email later. I wish I brought the photo. And with it, he sent us a huge box of Griffin's biscuits, ginger nuts, mallow puffs, and a whole lot of potato chips and other demonic things as well. But, <laughs> you know, it was great. But he told me in the email he wrote, he said, I've been telling everybody you used to work for me. <laughs> even though he wasn't even born when I was sweeping floors in his factory. I just think it's cool though. I then was sweeping floors trying to make enough money to pay my fees in Bible college in the middle of the night in a Griffin's factory. And now I'm the pastor of a church where the guy who's become the manager of that same company has been able to make a huge impact 
on the kingdom of God. That's how the kingdom of God works. So your short arms, no matter what your short arms look like, God can give you very, very long reach. I believe for kings to come from your body. I believe for queens to come from your body. I believe for God to raise you up. All of us, we're called to raise and lift because that's the heart of God. God, He's never been about crushing or squashing or reminding you of your inability, pointing out how short your arms are. He's always been a lift and a razor, even when it comes to the poor. I start talking about influence and you say, well, yeah, but what about the poor? Well, I'll tell you what the will of God is for the poor. It's to make them princes. Listen to the verse. It's in Psalm 113, verse 7. And this is what it says. He raises the poor out of the dust and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat them with princes, with the princes of his people. He raises, he lifts, he seats them with princes. Hannah in 1 Samuel, when she had her miracle son, prayed a prayer, and she prayed the same words in her prayer. She said in 1 Samuel 2 verse 8, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has made them, or and has them inherit a throne of honor. A what? A throne. That's where kings sit. That's where princes sit. A throne. He lifts and raises, he seats with princes, and he enables you to sit on a throne and reign in the call and the sphere and the area of life that you are called to. Wow, I just pray that believers in our church that we'll all see ourselves as potential influencers, that we don't want to just live introspective Christian lives affecting nobody. It's a funny thing. Sometimes people talk about Hillsong and ah, they just want to reach celebrities. We've never put an invite out and says, please, only celebrities come. We've never ever done anything to actually try to make celebrities come to our church. <laughs> never. But we want to reach the marginal, and we're doing that, and the influential, and the geographical, and that's our stated mission. And it's kind of weird, the thinking people has. It's like, we should have guards on the door, checking how many Instagram followers someone's got. You can't come in, you're a celebrity. Hey, <laughs> but I don't just want to reach celebrities, I want to raise people. Not just because they're famous. Do you think Mother Teresa, who's never heard of Mother Teresa? Never heard of her. You have never ever heard of Mother Teresa. Well, I can't see a hand anywhere. This is as bad as some terrible articles. I can't see a hand anywhere. <laughs> of course you have. Do you think? Mother Teresa went to Calcutta in India amongst the poorest of the poorest of the poor and thought to herself, I'm moving to Calcutta because I want to be really, really, really famous. Of course not. She didn't set out to be famous. She didn't even set out to be influential. She just set out to reach people one at a time and start with the person closest to her, Nelson Mandela. He didn't set out to one day be one of the names in history that will always stand as one of the greatest freedom givers, one of the most forgiving, most of the, one of the most inspirational people in history. He just cared about his people. He just wanted to make a difference. And God raised him up, I believe, for influence. And I believe God also can raise you up for influence. Influence does a lot of things for you. I'll tell you right now that influence, it will open doors that nobody can shut. Influence will allow you to leave a mark and leave a legacy. Influence will enable you to make an incredible difference, a significant difference. Influence, it'll give you a seat at the table. I mean, that's what happens. Influence gives you an invite to the table. You say, what table? Whatever table it needs to be in your life. For some, it might be the business board table. For others, a corporate board table or an education board table or a governmental board table or a media board table or an NGO's board table or a non-profit board table or perhaps the table of a client or a customer who is about to give you the greatest, greatest contract, the greatest ever opportunity you've ever had. He'll give you a seat at the table. Mephibosheth 
That's quite a mouthful. And his story's too long to tell, but I will tell you, he had short arms. He literally, literally was physically disabled, and he was in shame. He was humiliated and shamed because of who his grandfather was. And here he was from a place called Lodabar, where Dabar was set very low. <laughs> and King David gives him a seat at the table. He literally sat as the king's table as one of the king's own sons. He became, he was adopted in as a prince. I'll tell you, influence will add weight to your words. It's kind of cool being 63 as a pastor because when I was 29, I, same me, same blood, same DNA. But I just feel today when I speak, there's a greater lean into my words. That's what influence will do for you. It adds weights to your words. It will open doors for you ultimately. It will enable you to reign in life. And you are called to reign in life, which I just love. I think it's incredible that in Romans 5, 17, that the Bible says that through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you will reign in life through the one. Christ Jesus, you will reign. Let's be people who are committed to raising up people to reign in life. If you are committed to lifting the lives of others from taking the poor, taking the needy, taking the insecure, the poorest spirit, the people who perhaps looked like there was no way for them, and you live your life, pastors, you preach that way, you teach that way, you have that expectation, you get what you go for. We always went to build leaders and impactors in every sphere of life, and you get what what you go for. And so go for that. Go for building into people, raising them up, inspiring them, get them believing in themselves. Help them to lift their head held high because if you lift other people's lives, then you become a door opener. You become a gospel spreader. You become a kingdom builder. You become a vision impactor. You become a blessing initiator. You become a church strengthener. You become one that pleases the heart of God. Friends, don't let your short arms be your excuse. Short arms can still with God on your side give you very, very long reach. If you believe it, say amen. <laughs> so, as the worship team come, old and fierce, how many people here, you just know deep down on the inside there's more to your life than Maybe what you've experienced so far. You really do want to not just to be famous or just for money or for some surface thing like that, but to make a difference. You just really want in your walk, your sphere of life, to live in an influential way. If that's you, stand up right now. Stand up all over. Just stand up. You want to live your life beyond yourself. You want to make a difference. You want to live in an influential way. Would you lift both hands heavenward? And Father, I believe for this in Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you. None of us were saved for nothing. We weren't even just saved for heaven. We were saved to make a difference. You save us and you call us and you purpose us and you grace us. And I speak that into the lives of people here, whatever their walk, whatever their sphere, Lord, whatever it is they are called to, I pray that they truly can rise up and that they can rule and reign in a godly way, that they can live lives in a way that raises other people and lifts other people and equips and empowers other people. Lord, I just believe for that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want to read you one more scripture while you're standing there. Stick with us for one second here, and then we'll go out singing. You know, God lifts the lives of those who lifts the lives of others. I want to say that one more time. God lifts the lives of those who lift the lives of others. Listen to this beautiful few verses in Psalm 41. It's talking about those who are kind to the poor. Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. He gives them prosperity in the land. Talking about those who lift the lives of others and rescues them 
from their enemies. The Lord nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. That sounds to me like a benediction. That sounds to me like the kind of prayer you want to send people out with. So I'm going to ask everybody here to raise your hands one more time if you're more than happy to do that because I want to pray this prayer, these words, these verses over your life as you commit to believing God to lift your life and enable you to have a very long reach. Even when your world is small and your influence is little and your reach is virtually non-existent, but you are committed to lifting the lives of others. Remember, God lifts the lives of those who lift the lives of others. So I'm praying this now over every single person in the room, and you receive it into your spirit and into your heart. May the Lord rescue you when you are in trouble. May the Lord protect you and keep you alive. May the Lord give you prosperity in the land, in your land, in your field, in your place of service. May the Lord rescue you, deliver you from your enemies. May the Lord comfort you when you are sick. May the Lord restore you to health and keep you well. The promise over those who are committed to lifting the lives of the people around and about them. Praise God.